All right, our next speaker is Karen. Karen has been at Google for over six years and is currently focused on creating cutting edge test infrastructure for Chrome on mobile devices. All right, yep. take it away, Karen. Thank you. Oh, and everything works. We'll see. So, um, unfortunately, I'm the automation test lead for Chrome Mobile. I've been on Chrome Mobile for about three years. Before that, I spent a lot of time on, on various other products at Google. So, when we talk about Chrome Mobile, I just want to kind of make sure that you guys know what we mean by Chrome Mobile. We mean Chrome on all various Android devices, tablet phones, whatever is out there for Android. And we also mean Chrome on iOS, both tablets and iPhones. Uh, that's a kind of a weird echo here. But, um, so those are kind of the things. Android, there can be lots of different devices. Uh, we also might work on non-typical devices. So Chrome has been built around these core principles, the four S's we call them. Speed, stability, simplicity, security. They're kind of self-explanatory. Speed, of course, you want a browser to be fast. Stability, we don't want a browser to crash. Really annoying when you're actually just trying to load some pages and do some browsing. Simplicity, most people don't really care about browsers. They just want to see web pages. So we want to make sure that the browser is very simple to use so people can do what they actually want to do with the browser. Security, obvious again, we want to make sure that people trust the browser, that they trust using anything like online banking, buying stuff online, that kind of stuff. So these, Chrome was built around these core principles, but we also use some of the same principle when we look at how do we test Chrome. What are the things we can test, both how can we test Chrome and how can we make our test fast, stable, simple to write. Security is the one that kind of doesn't really fall into that. Um, in case you don't know, most of Chrome is open source, so we don't really care about the test results or anything being secure because we share it with the world. Um, so I'll talk about each of these in, 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 in turn, and we'll start with speed. So again, we want to make Chrome the fastest mobile browser. We run a variety of tests. Uh, we really want to lo look at tests like smoothness, making sure when you load a page, when you're scrolling, everything is fast, looking at yankiness, frame per sec, frame per seconds, all the usual stuff. Um, we're also looking at, okay, I'm starting up Chrome. We want that to be fast as well. Whether you start up Chrome from inside Gmail or whatever it is you're looking at, Facebook, whatever it is, Chrome should really start fast. And no matter whether your Chrome started a second ago or an hour ago, it should all start fast. So we also test those kind of things. We test various things that are really, okay, how fast is Chrome and make sure we're fast. The kind of test we run is a mixture of public benchmarks like Octane, Remio, there's a lot of other ones out there, and very Chrome-specific tests. Um, we typically look more at regression of Chrome than anything else. So even though we run public benchmark, we don't necessarily do a lot of comparison with other browsers. We want to make sure that we are fast. doesn't really care what other browsers are, as long as we are fast. That's the kind of things we care about. The Chrome-specific tests, those are, can be anything. They can be make sure that you can load a new tab fast, any kind of things. Um, um, and we run all performance tests continuously, just as we do all functional tests. They run the same way, no difference. The one difference with the performance test is that we actually upload all the results to the per, uh, something we call the perf dashboard. I'll show you a picture of that a little bit later. And this is pretty new. When I started Chrome about three years ago, we didn't have this dashboard. But this is amazing because we used to actually have, we have these things called perf sharers that's responsible for reviewing all the perf regressions. And they had to look at a lot of different perf, a lot of different graphs, especially for platforms. We have a lot of platforms that we run on, right? So it was really a lot of pain. With this new dashboard, well, it's not new anymore, but it was new compared to when I started, we have automatic detection of regressions and improvements. And we're based on that to use automatic alerts. So it's much easier to actually triage these things. And this is an example. I was just looking at the dashboard when preparing this talk. I was just looking at some of the alerts. This is probably one of the best, worst alerts I've ever seen, 22,000% regression. That's not normal. Um, in this case, you'll see that we have a lot of things sort of somewhere around zero, and then one of the benchmarks goes up, or one of the measurements and metrics goes up to 400. Um, so in this case, looking at the graph would also have been a lot easier. You could easily have seen that. But then we have a lot of graphs with a lot of platforms. Um, there's also another, actually, alert that's shown on this page that happens to be for Android. 10%, uh, that's kind of more the usual. In some cases, the actual regressions are very subtle, but the tool is still able to do it and it's still able to provide these alerts so we then triads, um, which make the whole process of dealing with these uh, regressions much easier. So how do we actually run these tests? Well, we have one performance test framework that we use across 
or most all platforms, called telemetry. It can perform any arbitrary actions on a set of web pages, and then it can report these metrics that we then upload to this dashboards. The beauty of telemetry is it's a Python framework that works on all platforms, um, Windows, Linux, Mac, Chrome OS, Android. Not yet on iOS, we are working on that, and I'll explain why iOS is a little bit different. Uh, it uses Chrome DevTools to control the browser. Again, iOS is a little bit different. And it allows us to just do any kind of regular stuff. This was actually an effort that was implemented by a mixture of our GPU and speed team. So we have teams specifically in Chrome for this, so it was developed by some of our developers. Um, one of the things that Telemity does, we heard a little bit earlier about a medic test and dealing with the network. We don't really want to do those kind of things. We don't want to do any kind of network with performance test either. If you do any kind of network um, communication, that can affect the result, can introduce some laziness, flakiness in the result, and we introduce noise. So we use web page replays instead. So web page replay allows us to basically run the test and then record all the responses and requests that, the, that actually the browser sends. And then we have that, we call it a page set, and then we use that page set when we actually run the test um, continuously. And that way, there's nothing with, with any network condition. Um, Especially important for Android because we've seen a lot of issues as soon as we introduce Wi-Fi, especially with our lab. We get flickiness, we get a lot of delay that way. So the way we do it on Android specifically is we have a web page replay server running on the host that the device is attached to, and then we talk to the host using USB. So no network, and on Windows and Linux it's even easier because you can actually run it on the same machine. So telemetry for Android, what are the challenges we had? Well, some of these tests are quite long running and anything you run on devices get, tends to be a bit slow. So we really spend a lot of time on running tests in parallel on multiple devices and speeding things up. But the thing we saw when we started doing that was that even we have like two Nexus 4s, two Nexus 5s, same devices, same model, supposedly. We run the same test on them. We actually see slight variances. So we actually see noise on our graphs. It doesn't make the graphs as useful. So we actually now run the same test always on the same device, which then can be other problem if the device actually turns out to go offline, which also happens every once in a while. We also seen that because we do this continuous testing, even though the devices are connected to a host server with a USB or USB bridge, they actually tend to every once in a while run out of battery. And the worst thing that can happen for us in our continuous system is that if devices run out of battery, they go offline, and someone actually have to go down and turn it back on. And we have people who do that, and they get kind of annoyed with it. <laughs> so we actually, especially, and this is something we mainly do for performance tests. A lot of the other tests, tests actually don't have the same issue. But for performance tests, we look at the battery uh, level. And then if it's below a certain threshold, we wait until the, the device has been charged, just to avoid this thing. Devices, unfortunately, still go offline and still becomes unresponsive. So we, again, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. We do have people who still have to go every once in a while and deal with that. Telemetry for iOS. Um, that's a lot more challenging. In general, iOS has its own challenges. So um, on iOS, we cannot use the Chrome rendering engine. So if anyone is familiar with Blink, we cannot use that. So we have to use the UI web view that's provided by iOS or in WK web view with iOS 8. Um, so there's no Chrome DevTools, but well, the good news is UI WebView, as Safari, and everything else is based on WebKit. So we still have the WebKit remote debugger. So we can still kind of talk to it. It's just not all the same APIs are there. Blink has kind of diverted a bit from WebKit, so not everything is there. We made, we made some changes at some point, both for telemetry and for actually Chrome drivers, a web driver, to the, the dev tools that are not available in WebKit. Um, it's also not quite as easy to actually connect to the UI WebView as we do on Chrome. Uh, we have various things on Chrome that we hooked in, so you can actually connect always to Chrome using DevTools. So even if you're just developing your web app, if you have never tried DevTools, you should definitely do that. Um, but there's some things in place that we don't really want to. Um, Apple really don't really want everybody to connect to a UI web view in any app. There are some issues there, and I completely understand that. It just means that it's, it's sometimes they have a restriction that you can only connect to an app that you build yourself. That's the sign with developer keys. So there's some issues there. We can easily use it, but there's some issues kind of like we can't make necessarily everything available to the public because we actually have teams outside of Chrome using telemetry because it is a public tool. Anyone can use it, and anyone can connect to like Chrome and Android and use it that way. 
So this was about how do we make Chrome fast? How do we make our test run as fast as possible? Some of these things are actually general things, and Anke, Anke talked about some of them a little bit this morning. Uh, this is a little more specific to mobile, but still. This sounds obvious. You should only write integration tests for things that you cannot test with unit tests. Everyone kind of knows that. Unfortunately, that's not the case for us. We moved very, very fast. In case you don't know, we shipped the first releases of Chrome uh, on Android a little two and a half years ago, the first beta. The first two publics was the summer two years ago. So we moved very fast. And unfortunately, it also means that we haven't moved as fast with the tooling, and again, on the mobile tooling is not as good. So for Android, we have several instrumentation tests, which tend to be integration tests, and which run on the device. That should really be the unit tests, but we can run faster that way. iOS, we have the same thing. I'll talk a little more about the kind of test. We use something called KIF, and we have a tendency to write KIF tests instead of unit tests. So that's kind of the thing that we are working on, making it faster, making better frameworks, better test framework, better tooling. Um, for integration tests, something we also seen that, uh, again, might be obvious, you should really only use the UI for the actual test. So if you're writing UI tests, um, don't set up the test, set up the environment using UI. Set up the environment in any other way, like ideally calling into the app. Um, we spend a lot of time on convincing everybody that this is okay. We really want the test to focus only on what the tests are focusing on. Then we can have other tests to focus on the set of pieces we're using the UI, but not in the same test. Um, so for Android, a lot of stuff we really do has to deal with devices. We want everything on devices, I'll explain why later. And we have to make sure that that runs fast. So the setup of the devices, the setup of the test, and the running the test, everything we try to do in parallel, which speeds things up a little bit. Uh, well, in some cases, quite a bit. So a lot of our tests have data dependencies. So we try to write our test hermetic, as Anke mentioned, which means that we, instead of connecting to some HTTP server, we actually have the local pages, where well, we can. Um, so that's a lot of data, and we ideally have to have that on the device. It actually turns out that pushing data to devices was a huge bottleneck for us. And we worked on that kind of two times in the last year and a half to, to improve that, keep improving it, because it, it is big. And we have, I think one test has about 200 megs of data or something like that. So it's a little insane at times. Um, other things we're doing, and this is actually, again, pretty recently, we're trying to avoid running tests on devices where we can. So if we have any kind of test that's pure unit test, that just tests, for example, Java logic, that doesn't have to run on the device. We can test Java logic on the desktop instead, much faster, we don't have to push anything to the device. So we're working on adding more, having more of those kind of frameworks in place. So, iOS. Yeah, iOS again is a little more challenging for us. Um, we run tests and simulator where possible. Um, unfortunately, we have seen that we can't catch everything on simulator. So we still have to run on devices. But we have various systems where it's like we want to run tests before we submit changes. We try to do that on simulator. And then once changes are submitted, we run that on devices. And then we kind of deal with flakiness or deal with issues or failures at that point. Um, we're a little behind on iOS compared to Android for a lot of things. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is simplicity. So um, make the Chrome user experience as simple as possible. Some of these things are not really related to automation, but it's kind of to give, provide a big picture. Um, UX review, because I think everybody does that, make sure that the features are simple to use, that they look good, that it's just a good user experience. And we also do manual exploratory testing of things and make sure that everything works the way we, we see. But we also found that automated testing actually also promotes simple UI, in the sense that if you have an automated test, that's very difficult to write. You're like, oh, why do I have to click all these buttons all the time to get to this thing? Probably that's not a problem with your UI framework or your UI testing framework. It might be a problem with the actual UI. So we use that kind of thing to also say, okay, is the UI simple? If it's simple to write a test, good. The UI is probably simple as well. Um, so this is a good point to talk about what kind of automated functional testing do we do. So we'll start with Android again. Um, we have a large list of tests, and sometimes I wish we didn't have as many. We were, they're covering different areas. So for Android especially, we share a lot of code with Chrome and desktop, and that code is written in C++. So we, have, we are running a lot of the same C++ unit tests across Android, Mac, Windows, Linux, Chrome OS even. 
And there's also a few integration tests. We have something we call browser tests, homegrown, that run more integration tests also within C++. Um, we just recently introduced RoboElectric to do host side, so that's test that runs on, on the desktop. Uh, Java test, unit test, again, we want to move more towards more unit testing. Uh, Android instrumentation test is really where we had a lot of the Android specific testing done. Um, they're generally integration tests. Um, they've been very useful, but we've seen lately, especially if anyone has heard anything about Lollipop, that there's sometimes we can't just use instrumentation tests because while we prefer to push the test down the stack, so more unit tests, fewer integration tests, there are some tests we really will need to test across applications. So make sure that search works with Chrome. So if you click on a search result, you get into Chrome, everything works. So we do have a few UI automator tests that are really those end-to-end -end tests. But we typically only write UI automator tests for anything that integrates with all the applications. So iOS. We also can, again, we share, little, we share some code with the rest of Chrome. So we have some C++ unit tests that we write. We also have some very specific for iOS. The majority of our tests are KIF tests. Uh, it's an open source framework called Keep It Simple. We actually fought KIF uh, before version two because when the version two was a significant rewrite of KIF, very different API, and we had a lot of KIF one tests and they were actually working for us, so we created a fork at that time. Um, this is integration testing again. This run inside the application, but we only test the application on test. But that's okay because we don't have as tight integration on iOS with a platform, although there's some integration with other Google products, but not like we do on Android, where we're a really big part of the platform, at least on the Nexus devices. So, how do we make Chrome tests simple to write and run? So, again, some of these are general, um, and some of these actually things that not new to when I do it Chrome, it's something we found out a lot of us uh, before we, I, long time before I moved to Chrome as well. Um, one of the big things is that developers should really write their tests and the features in the same language. So if you have a developers writing the test in one language, that, uh, the, test, the features in one language and the test in a completely different language, that's a disconnect, that's a context fix. Uh, and it makes it less simple to write the test. They have to keep changing all the time. So as a testing team, we are the ones who actually introduce a lot of this new test frameworks. Some come from developers, but we have introduced, especially for Android, a lot of the new ones. Um, we have to provide some interesting sample tests. We have to make it easy for developers to get up to speed with these new frameworks. And also good utilities. Um, so again, which kind of tied into the next one, make it easy to perform setup without UI. We provide a lot, try to provide a lot of good utilities for people to get to the state where they want to test something. That also makes the test easier to write. So in Chrome, a lot of it is starting a, starting a new tab and load a page. So we have utilities for that on all the platforms that makes those kind of things easy. Um, I already talked that one. Um, also making it easier to run the test. Um, I'll talk a little bit specifically, especially for Android about that. But developers, some developers like their VI or GMAG just want to, Emacs and just want to run it on the command line and some have an ID. We want to make sure that we kind of, everybody can run their test easily. And we even want to make sure that, okay, I've written my test, hopefully. I've written my code, I've written test with the code. I even sent it out for code review, which we do with everything we do, and I got to look good to me, so I want to submit it. So we have various things that we can do this that helps with this. So we can even submit our code to something we call tribots. So I've written my test, I think it's good, I'm about to send it out for review, but I want to make sure it's passed on all platforms. And I don't have necessarily have access to all platforms. I don't, personally don't have access to a Windows machine. So I send off a try job, it runs it on all the platforms, and then I know whether my, actually my changes work. I'll break something. Um, so now I submit it, I get code review, get look good to me, and then I actually want to submit, oh, I've submitted for code review, I want to submit the change. So we extend the try bot with something we call a commit queue, well, it runs the same test, use the same, same infrastructure, but at the end of it, it says, okay, everything passed, we're gonna submit your things for you. And this is a very old CL I did a very, very long time ago, but it has this little commit thing, so all I have to do is I have to click that checkbox that sends out the commit, I get an email later whether it worked or not. Hopefully it works. Um, so how do we do, what, how does this sort of go specifically to Android? What are the things we looked at? So if we looked at the list of tests, the kind of tests we run for Android, it's a very large list of different test frameworks. So we have one unified test runner for all the types of different tests. 
So it's not like, okay, I'm running a C++ unit test. What do I do to call to run these tests? No, it's the same test runner for everything. And the test runner determines which test to run based on the type, the filter for some of our Java tests. We can even say like only run test for our, this feature, only one test that's related to tabs or the tab strip we have at the top. Whatever it is, we can kind of determine those kind of things. The test runners also handle anything with the, the devices, any communication, so if you're familiar with Android, anything with ADB, anything with the sharding, it handles those. It also handles any kind of issues with those, any kind of flakiness. Um, so I talked earlier about how developers should write the, the test in the same, thing, uh, same language as they write the code. So we actually, Chrome is again, it's a big part of C++, everything that was there until Android came along with C++. Um, Android came along, we started introducing Java and some of the developers that have been working on Chrome for a long time were like, what the heck is this? Um, but our developers typically write in both of them. So the specific developers function on Chrome and Android, uh, focus on Chrome and Android, write in both languages. So when they write new features, they will write both C++ and Java. Few times they will only write Java if it's only Android specific UI, that's where we only use Java. But that's very seldom the case. So they will write unit tests, especially in C++, when they write the C++ code, they might write C++ integration tests, and then they will write Java instrumentation tests or Java unit tests for the pieces that they have in Java. So they stay in the same language, although they have two languages they typically write in. Um, except for UI Automator, all our test frameworks can call application code directly, so that makes it a lot easier. Again, instead of using a UI to set up, you can call directly and then open a new tab, load a new page, whatever it is you need to do. Um, iOS, uh, slightly different, but some of the same things. We have a lot of common utilities uh, trying to set up the app, trying to clear between tests, which actually turned out to be a little bit difficult for us. Um, but those kind of things, common access, we have a lot of utilities for that. When I started on Chrome about three years ago, um, we hadn't even released Chrome on iOS yet. But we actually had a very good testing team that were doing a lot of stuff to write tests. Uh, at the time, they were using UI automation. I don't know if anyone ever used it, but it was a little bit weird for them in that they were coding in Objective-C, and then they went to JavaScript to write their test. Very different frameworks, very different ways of writing things. And again, I, I will say that I'm very actually proud of the team at how many tests they actually had in UI all. A, but it was very difficult to maintain difficult to write, difficult to do these content switch, but it's also led that a lot of time the tests were written very late in the cycle because you kind of finished everything in Objective-C and then you went to JavaScript. So now we're using KIF, where tests are written in Objective-C, it's much more, people write and generally test much earlier, much happier with writing tests. Uh, again, we run tests as part of the application so we can call directly, we don't have to do the UI. So the next thing we want to talk about is stability, so that's the next step. Basically, you don't want to see any of the things at the bottom. You don't want to see a sad face. You don't want to see that, oh, unfortunately, Chrome has stopped working. You just want to browse. So what do we do to make Chrome the most stable browser? Well, we try to catch crashes as early as possible. I'll talk about the specific stability tests we have for that a little bit later. But we also review what are happening out in the wild. So one of the things with a browser is that people view very different pages. And we can't always predict, and we can we can definitely can't test all the web pages out there. So we're seeing different crashes. We're seeing crashes, and when we go to the public, uh, we call it our stable channel that we've never seen in our testing. And it turns out to be often turns out to be something with the specific setup, the specific web pages used. But we're reviewing those crashes very, very rigorously and looking at them and trying to deal with them as fast as possible. For Android, we're lucky that we have a public beta channel and we have a quite a decent amount of users of it, so we can get those kind of stability numbers very early before it goes out to a larger public. And we do try one of the things, so we have about six weeks in beta, and we do try one of the main things we do in beta, uh, I'll talk about a little bit more later, one of the main things we do is looking at the stability numbers, make sure we fix those before we go out to the wider, wider user base. Um, we also have our own crashes from our tests, so our tests use the same crash reporting, the same uploading of the crashes as our production build, so we can use the same, actually, UI to review them. We can even compare, okay, these crashes, we found them in the public, found them outside when we shipped, but we didn't see it in our tests, why not? And we can kind of look at that and we can compare tests versus the real data and see what's going on, our tests not as useful as we want them to be. So for Android, we have a number of stability tests. Uh, we have a test we call public URL. Basically what it does is run through a list of public URLs. 
it also scrolls up and down just to make sure. And it uses Chrome drivers. So Chrome driver is our internal implementation of WebDriver that works on Android and, and desktop. Um, it, it sounds kind of simple, uh, but sadly we actually find a lot of crashes. We haven't seen a lot of crashes lately, but when we started doing this, we saw more. We've stabilized a little bit. But we do see a lot of crashes just by loading web pages, which is kind of sad. So, but at least we cast it early. Uh, we also run these on a mixture of tablets and phones, Nexus, non-Nexus devices. So we try to get coverage from a little more than we actually normally do. I'll talk more about what devices we normally run on. Um, on the same kind of setup, we run Android Monkey Test. We run 50,000 events. We actually lately see more crashes on Monkey, but that's the, the nature of these random events just stresses the browser. Unfortunately, it is random events, so reproducing these is also a little more tricky. Um, we also have this relatively, well, relatively, it's this, we used about 11 months thing called Clusterfuss that we also use. I'll talk more about that later because it's actually part of our security team that developed this, developed for finding security issues, but we also use it for finding crashes in general. So on iOS, um, there's no iOS monkey, at least none that does what we want to do, so we have, still have the popular URLs test, but we combine it with some kind of random events. So we run through a top of list of URLs. We also have some URLs that we know are known to crash Chrome or the UI web view. And we also run through those, especially when we are notified when the new um, iOS version comes out and hopefully that UI web view issues are fixed. Uh, scroll up and down and then we perform those random events. It's based on the same framework that we use for functional testing, so KIF, so that way it's easy for, for anyone to fix or anyone to, to run and improve, hopefully. Um, we have heard a lot about flickiness already, even though it's early in this conference. Um, so how do we make our tests as stable as possible and avoid flickiness? So since this is mobile, we see a lot of general flickiness from the devices, just dealing with devices. A lot of flickiness with that. And we also have seen some general flickiness in our frameworks, and those are really what we as a team work on. If there's a flaky test, we have this thing we call Sheriff, um, that are the ones monitoring our continuous builds. And they will look at, okay, this test seems to be flaky. They have various tools for that. They'll disable it, create a bug, and developers are supposed to fix them. Hopefully they do that. If they don't, the test is basically dead. Um, so what are we doing specifically for Android to eliminate the non-test flakiness? Again, devices. Everything is devices. Uh, we reset the devices. We actually remove a lot of data for the devices. We restart them. We set them up a certain way with certain properties. Um, for, again, I talked about that a little bit earlier, that for performance tests, low battery, we ignore them. And we try to deal with devices going offline, both before and during tests. So we have various places where we actually test which devices are online and run tests on that. Um, and we try to ignore devices that go offline. We even, so our infrastructure team set up some things so that are uh, automatically notifying our sysadmins that will actually then go and look at why is this device offline. Normally a reboot will help. Sometimes we have to completely reinstall or reset the devices. Um, we also have to deal with ADB flakiness. Anyone who's run tests on Android devices has probably run into issues with ADB. So we do a lot of retries, a lot of resetting. Um, James showed that the phone restarted a lot to run tests. We do the same thing. Lots of restarts. But also is one of the reasons that the tests are kind of slow at times. Um, iOS, I already mentioned this a little bit. Test and simulator is not only faster, but also more stable. But we don't haven't seen issues. Um, uh, we have seen issues that are only on devices. Um, we are trying to figure out a better way to talk to the devices and kind of improving some of this stuff. And I suggest that if you're interested in running any kind of test of devices, there's a talk later today uh, by some of the folks on, that we work very closely with on better ways and more stable ways to run on devices. So we're working very close with Jay and the others who are talking later today on figuring out how can we improve this both for iOS and Android. Security. So um, mainly talk about making Chrome the most secure browser. It's one of, probably one of the most important things you can do as a browser is to make sure that you're secure, make sure people have confidence in that you're secure. So we have various things. Uh, you probably, if you're any, at all interested in security, you've probably heard about the Chrome reward programs, owned and pwned, and all those kind of things that's going on to just kind of get people to report issues, make sure we, so we can fix things as fast as possible. But we really try to find any security issues ourselves, same as other things. You want to find them, you don't want them to go out to the public. And we have this tool called Clusterfuss that was implemented by our amazing security team. 
Uh, it finds bugs by analyzing existing crashes. It uses fuzzers to trigger crashes, and then it can actually automatically determine if it's a crash. Can it potentially be a security issue? Yes or no? And it's it's runs a variety of tests. I think we have 40 plus fuzzers or something like that. I forget. Some of them are actually close to our popular URLs. Run to a list of URLs, see what happens. Others actually go in and, and change the DOM and do weird things with, with pages and see if that crashes Chrome. So any kind of things that could be security issues related with that, go in and check. If it crashes, this tool is so amazing, it can actually determine more or less automatically if it's a security crash or not. It also goes actually in, and this is one of the things that's been most successful for us compared to our other stability tests, is that it goes in and it tries to reproduce the crash and tries to find a minimal test case that can reproduce the crash to make it as easy as possible for developers to, to actually reproduce locally and fix things. It can even go in and when things are fixed, it will actually go in for the ones that are reproducible, try and rerun them and see if the things is really fixed. Of course, not all crashes are reproducible, but still, this is very useful. In the time it's been working for Android, we found much more crashes early, let alone we also find security issues earlier. So this is a big shout out to our security team with this. Fortunately, we don't have support for iOS yet. That's what happens with a lot of our uh, tools that iOS is kind of a little bit behind. We do want to do that soon because we really want to see more of these crashes. Um, we also have a few functional tests for various privacy security areas. Um, it's Chrome, we want to make sure incognito is still incognito, those kind of things. Um, I actually had one more bonus as for you, scalability. Um, so scalability is both that we're a browser. We want to make sure that we work for all web pages, that we don't crash, all that useful stuff, but we can't really test the entire web. So we do not depend a lot on users as testers. Anker was mentioning this with test testers, but luckily for at least Chrome and Android, we have a public beta channel. So we actually have a large amount of users running on this. They'll get new features earlier. We always ship new features to the beta channel first. Um, we can look at the stability norms, as I kind of mentioned that earlier. We can actually get this data before it goes out to the largest, larger population. We can fix things. We also do experiments. So some of these new features that we publish on the beta channel, we, um, if people opt in to send us metric, we look at how people are using these new features. And sometimes we find that people either don't really find the features, they don't use it, whether it is that they don't find it or just find it useful, useless, we don't really know. We know they're not using it. Some cases people will tell us. That's also the good thing about having people on the beta channel. They're typically very vocal and will tell us when things are not working. So we had issues where we basically never published that feature in that state to the larger population on our stable channel because the feature just wasn't working as we expected. So the beta channel allows us to do those things. And it allows us, especially with, again, testing the entire web, we get more people using on more, more uh, web pages doing things that we don't actually do in our own testing. And we also be able to dynamically enable features, which is actually was pretty new, especially on iOS. I remember when we implemented it. It's been in Google 3 for some of our uh, web, pages, web apps for a long time, but it was pretty new when we implemented it. And it actually allows us to get some of this data and experiment, do more experiments as well. Um, so scalable, uh, we use that a lot actually for our test and build infrastructure. So one of some of the challenges we are seeing um, on Android, let's start with Android. So on Android we run, I think 30,000 is a little conservative, but those are at least some of the ones we run. We actually run a little bit more than that. And we always run on devices. Um, so we have a continuous build machines, we call it uh, BuildBots. Each of those we have that run on Android has between one and eight devices attached. We try to have more towards the eight than the one. The one, when we only have one device attached, it's mainly because it's running a very special configuration. Um, but when we run, when we have to do large, uh, scale largely, like when people are actually, the um, continuous build machines that people run on when they're submitting new code, then we have eight and we, sh we chart the test, we run everything in parallel, things run faster that way. But that's a lot of devices. Um, I don't have any numbers on the devices lately. Because, uh, I know how many we kind of got to the thing, but it's a lot of devices. Keeping them up is very tricky. And again, when they go offline, we have to have physically, people physically go down and restart them. Um, we mainly run on, well, we run on homogeneous devices on each build bot. Uh, because we shot the test, we don't want to have like a Nexus 4, Nexus 5, or a Samsung S5 or something like that. We want to run on the same configurations, and then instead we have different build machines for different configurations. 
Uh, we mainly run on Nexus devices with user bills, user debug bills. Um, this has been historically what worked for us, especially with older Android versions. With newer Android versions, especially with KitKat, our tests started to get a lot more stable because KitKat started to get a lot more stable. And our code in general started to get a lot more stable as well. Everything matured. So um, it, it's gotten better. So we put potentially, and again, we're working with some other teams and looking at not running only Nexus devices. We have some non-Nexus devices. We mainly use those for performance and stability tests and a few things, but mainly Nexus devices because they're the same kind of configuration. Um, you might ask, why are you running all these tests on devices? We tried on the emulator. And I know some of my colleagues from Google 3 have had big success with emulator. We never had that. And we're also very uh, hardware intensive for the rendering. And those kind of things have been sta unstable a little bit flaky on the emulator, especially if you're looking at running it on like compute engine or something like that. So it just hasn't really worked for us. We are definitely investing in alternatives. We really don't want to run all these devices. And again, we're working with the, the teams inside of Google to find better alternatives, uh, especially working a lot with the team that used to be a Purify. I don't know if you guys heard of I.O. We acquired this company called Purify. We're working a lot with them since they have solved some of the stability issues for running on devices as well. Um, for iOS, um, the challenges has been some cases worse, some cases better. The advantage of iOS is we don't have the same explosion of Android devices that we have on Android devices. So there are fewer devices, which makes it a lot easier. But we then have more, more issues with those specific devices. So we used to run the test first on an iPod, then on an iPad. Um, and we saw this weird flakiness for our test. And we were like, the test runs perfectly fine locally. We didn't understand it. So we pulled on off and we created one built machine with iPods and one machine with iPads or iPhones and iPads. And things just started getting better. So something with the way we were communicating with the devices when we had more than one device attached just made things unstable. Um, and we haven't come up with a good way of running multiple simulators, so we don't have the same kind of sharding running things parallel that we have on, on Android. So it's, it's lucky that we don't have to scale to as many devices because we don't really have the capability. As for Android, we are working with various teams to come up and, and improve that, um, but we're still struggling with some of those things. Um, in general, again, please help us make Chrome the best mobile browser. Uh, if you're doing web applications, web driver, Chrome driver is our implementation of web driver. By all means, please use it. Please report if you're seeing any issues. We are monitoring the, the various bug repositories and everything for Chrome driver. We try to make it better every time, so please let us know if it doesn't work for you. And if you just in general have issues with Chrome, we have a public bug repository we call CRBug, linked to here. Report box. We really want to hear from you. We really want to make Chrome the best browser, so any, any issues you have, let us know. Or if you just have requests to more tests we should be on, more features, please let us know. And that is what you have. And I have the yellow button that also means I should take questions. Thank you, Karen. That's pretty amazing. So since we have been taking some live questions for the last two talks, um, why don't we take one from the moderator link? So great talk. Um, from the moderator link, uh, when you had the identical devices that performed slightly differently, did you ever investigate that and figure out whether it was due to minor hardware revisions, other running applications, or something else? As far as I remember, our speed team did all most of it. As far as I remember, it was typically slight hardware variation. Like, if you look at a Nexus 4, the, that was the first Nexus 4 coming out versus the last Nexus 4 coming out, slight hardware configurations was really typically the problem. Or slight things like all hardware is slightly different. I mean, it's tested to reach a certain spec, but the spec typically have some variances in the spec that you're allowed to be inside certain things. So just little things just accumulate up to see some, some noises. One more? If you want to go to the mic. So how does the fuzzer investigate crashes? Looking at the stack sometimes doesn't help reproduce it. How do you reproduce crashes found by the fuzzer? So, so the first will basically take whatever test case it was. So a lot of our test cases are um, HTML pages. So take the HTML page and it will actually look at it. It will actually try to limit what's in the HTML page. So some of the HTML 
eight places have like CSS, JavaScript. So we'll actually try and remove some of those pieces and come down to the minimal set uh, on the minimal page that will actually reproduce it. Uh, regarding the stability issues when multiple devices connected, uh, I face the same problem with Android devices as well. Uh, uh, I work on a native application uh, where I cannot work on a simulator because it needs a Google push to be enabled and from KitKat I believe you cannot add a uh, Google account to that. So Google push service cannot be enabled. Mm. With this multiple three, I generally run on three devices which are interdependent on each other to make the tests, uh, test running. So once one device goes offline, I tried multiple ways like even rebooting or restarting the port. But once it goes offline, it sometimes come up and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, once the device go offline, you're more or less screwed, uh -huh. to be honest, because once it's offline, it's very difficult to get back up without manual intervention. That's what we've seen. And we actually have, we have this sysadmin that keeps our lab running in general. And I don't think they were very happy when we added Android devices to the lab because all of a sudden they spend a lot of time on that. We do a lot of trying to restart before this happened yeah. and do a lot of dealing with ADB and sometimes restarting ADB with on the device and on the thing. Um, but the people you really should be talking to is, I suggest you talk uh, later today when Jay and, I don't know if many is probably not here, but at least Jay I know is here, is gonna do a talk about dealing with devices. Um, they've solved a lot of these issues and they solved them much better than we did. So we're doing a lot of retries and these kind of things, but we still have a lot of devices going offline. These guys have barely no devices going offline. Okay. So they do some magic. Okay. They're smarter than us, I guess. I'll just get the names to talk to. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. We have time for one last question. Hi. I was wondering, how do you automate performance testing of the network stack, both in general and in realistic scenarios? So the good thing is that even though we are doing this where we have the web page replaced, we actually can still trigger the network stack and that kind of thing. So we still use telemetry to doing network stacks. We just don't talk out using the Wi-Fi to trigger the network stack. So we still, still because even the talking to the host actually triggers the network stack and that way we can still test the network stack with that. So we have a team dedicated to the network stack completely and I know they've done a lot of telemetry tests as well. But for, but for Wi-Fi wi -Fi and GPS, you don't do any uh, we, real we don't, testing? No, we don't do any testing for Wi-Fi. It's something that we always wanted to do, but we just can't get anything stable enough. And we have a big issue with, um, in our lab, we had to put up more access points to even have Wi-Fi doing. We have no devices on 3G at all, um, which is sad. And we're trying to, again, we're working very closely with Jay and the others that we'll talk later today to deal with those kind of things. Thank you.